short introduction uh, of myself. I'm Nate Callender. I'm a faculty member in the aerospace department. I uh, have been here. This is my 16th year now in the department. Um, I teach, well, I coordinate the technology concentration, which if you're not familiar, that is a concentration, one of our six that sends folks on to engineering graduate school. So the courses that I teach are all engineering, math and physics related, uh, fundamentals of aerodynamics, aircraft performance, uh, a senior level research class in my laboratory. I've also done the graduate level statistics class for our master's program, which is much more aviation management related, but that course was uh, something that I did as well. And this really came about due to much of what we've done, which is the last year and a half. So all of my courses, which include a lot of math, a lot of physics-based questions, were all hard copy, pen and paper exams. And so I had what I thought were very good questions that were very complex and caused them to think and had multiple steps that I could see their progression. But when COVID bumped us out of the classroom, those didn't really make sense anymore. Um, so I'm not going to email students a piece of paper, have them take it, scan it, and send it back. That just doesn't seem to make sense. So I had all of my courses recorded. Uh, I had been doing that for five years prior to COVID. So I had videos of every single lecture I'd taught for every course just sitting in the hopper. And so providing content to remote asynchronous classes was not an issue for me. But the testing and the quizzing was. So what I did immediately was jump into D2L, which I'd used D2L a lot for file management and grades and communication, all that sort of thing, but I'd never used the quiz feature for any kind of graded assignment. And so that's what I threw my time and energy into in March of 2020, was learning that and converting all of my exams into a D2L quiz format with all the different question types uh, and all those goodies and, try, and I tried to make it where we could prevent uh, academic misconduct when you've got all this stuff online and who knows where they're taking it, who they're taking it with and who they're giving answers to or getting answers from. So I tried to keep that in mind with everything in addition to saving me time on grading. Because when we went remote, my class size has just ballooned. Our department's actually grown exponentially. And it started four years ago and it just continued into the the pandemic year and a half. So, so many more students, all this stuff. So that, that's kind of what motivated all of this. And I saw some things and I learned some things through trial and error over that year and a half that I wanted to share with folks. So I am by no means an expert in D2L. I'm not an expert in D2L quizzes, but just the things that I've picked up, I wanted to share with folks so you didn't have to struggle through it either. Uh, if you wanted to investigate doing this, because it really has been a great thing. And even though many of my classes are back in person, I'm still using these for testing. So I have tests either in a computer lab or I'm teaching one remote synchronous class and I'm still using this for all of them, whether in person or, or remote. So at this point, I am going to, and by the way, if you ever have a question over the course of this session, just either chat it and Kim's gonna be watching the chat and she'll bring it up immediately or just ask me, just speak up and I'll pause and we can chat about it. I may not know the answers to your questions. Somebody in here might though. And so we can all help each other. So if you've got little tips and tricks that you can share along the way, please do that. Uh, I'm just gonna share some that I have seen. Um, I am going to begin by sharing my screen with everybody. And so what you see, what you should see now is uh, D2L page. Is that showing up for everyone? I can't see anybody. Yes, it is. Okay, excellent. Good. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into to more of the basic stuff. I'm going to assume you can, we can all find these things. Uh, so under assessments, you go to quizzes, and that's where the quizzes pop up if you've created them. But the first thing I'm going to do is start with the, the question library. So here under question library um, is where you can start creating questions. And so that would be you'd click on new and then you just have all this, this plethora of, of choices. 
but I'm going to talk through a couple of them with some tips on a few of them. And I'm not sure if you can see this. Can everybody see this file that just popped up? Yes. Okay, so good. So you're seeing everything on my screen. I'm gonna talk through this outline that I've made up just with some of my thoughts on different question types, some tips on different question types with some more overall uh, lessons learned, I guess, on quizzing and testing in general. So. We're going to start off with dividing question types into two categories. So this is how I've, I've made my grouping. So in my question library, I have separated out the different types of questions I want to ask into either calculation questions, where they're going to interact and input something numeric. And this obviously, Wandi, and for others who do numeric things, this is right up your alley. This is really the reason why I did this, because those question types were the most difficult to, to get to work correctly. And then I've got the big non-calculation type. So either you've got a calculation quiz or it's a non-calculation quiz and all the other question types, the vast majority fall into the non-calculation, but that's where we'll start. So if you look at this file, the first thing we're gonna look at would be a multiple choice question. And I'll show you one, show you what it looks like. These are, as it says here on number three, these are the easiest type to program maybe short of true false, but multiple choice are really easy. So if I go into non-calculation, you can see all this big library of questions I've built up. Uh, we can go into this one, which stands for continuity and Bernoulli equation. And then we can go into, I think this is the one, yeah. No, 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 that's multiple select. Um, let me go into continuity. Sorry, I had, I had this. Where is that? I need to find the right, the right section. Okay, this is the one I want to look at, Newton's laws. Okay, so these are all questions on Newton's laws. And if you open one, this is kind of what it looks like when you create a question. So you select new and choose your question type. This is a multiple choice question. So these are the things that show up that you can consider when creating a multiple choice question. Like I said, this is super easy. So you just type in your question and you've got, you can add different numbers of options, but I think three is the standard number of options. So like an A, B, and C you'd see on a normal multiple choice, you can add a D, E, F, however many. The specific thing about multiple choice questions is they only allow one correct answer. So whatever options you put in there, however many option answer options, you can only allow people to select one. You can't have multiple correct answers here in multiple choice. So you type your question, you would put what the possible answers are. So this is based upon Newton's laws, his typical laws, so first, second, or third. And then you have to check to tell D2L which one is the correct answer. And over on the right, it gives you a preview of what it might look like to a student and where they can select their answer. You can, so on a question like this, where there are three laws from Newton, I'm questioning them on, and they're first, second, and third, randomizing the order of the answers doesn't make sense because it wouldn't really make sense for it to show up options second, third, first. I mean, that doesn't make it any harder or easier. So I just keep these unrandomized. But if you had different types of answers that weren't sort of ordered like first, second, third, and you wanted to prevent student A from getting an answer from student B by some for somehow some easy reason, then you can randomize. So you just check the randomize box and it'll mix up the answer order for everybody, um, which is a way to protect yourself. You can input a default point value for this. But when you go to create an actual quiz, right now, this is just a quiz question. You have to add this into a quiz. And when you add questions into quizzes, when you're creating the whole thing, then you can go back and set how many points you want each question to be. So this default point value for me doesn't really do anything. I just put a number in here, but I end up changing that because if I have a one question quiz, and if this is the question, I will set this to 100 points because everything for me is out of a 100 point scale and then I weight it in my overall average. So there's a simple, uh, simple multiple choice question. 
And then when you're done, you save it and you've got that question. So I've got this question fed into other things. So if you ever make a change, you have to tell it where you want that change filtered through. Um, so I'm filtering it through everything. So that's multiple choice. Um, who in here uses multiple choice a lot? Some of you do. Okay, so th this is probably the easiest thing you can do. If you're a multiple choice questioner, these are super easy. Just build up a question library with a bunch of multiple choice questions. Uh, no big deal. But then you can go to maybe more complex question types. And so the next one that is maybe a little bit more complex, uh, like a one small level above multiple choice is multiple select. So when you go to create a new question, the question type multiple select, if you go to that, the really big change from multiple choice to multiple select is multiple select allows you to, to put in any number of correct answers. Multiple choice limits you to one out of all the options. Multiple select, you can have multiple correct answers. So if you want to discern or if you want to see if the student knows a little bit more than just maybe selecting one thing that they know is one right answer, you can put multiple right answers scattered in a large number of options and see if they can actually pick out the right ones. Well, that's multiple select. So we can see an example of that if I go to uh, another one of these question categories. So I have to remember where I went. Let me look back at this file. Sorry about that. So continuity Bernoulli lift. Okay, that's where I went. Continuity Bernoulli lift. All right, so here is a multiple select question. You can see with that. And this is what it looks like when you create a multiple select question. You obviously type in the question and then you put all of the various options. So just some background on this one. There are several different equations that we can build up to describe the force of lift on a lifting surface like a wing. And the different equations have different strengths and weaknesses. And so this one is getting at for one specific method of lift, what are the weaknesses? What are the things that make this one difficult to use? And these are the two correct answers. Um, so I've put in all these other things which show up in the equations and the students should be familiar with these, but they would need to know that these are the two that are the difficult uh, issue, the, the sticking issue with this specific set of equations. So it's just, again, you make all the choices you want, you check to make sure um, it knows, D2L knows the correct answer. You can randomize these. So this would be a case where randomizing might make sense. If you didn't want them to show up in this order for everybody, you could click randomize and it would randomize all those orders for each student who gets it. So there, you know, with these limited numbers, there's gonna be somebody perhaps in an 85 person class who gets the same order but it's unlikely they'll be together when they're, when they're doing this. Hopefully they're not. The next thing with this one that really makes this one, again, more complicated is how you want it to grade it. So I didn't make this clear at the beginning, but whenever you offer a quiz in D2L, you can set it to automatically grade and show the student their grade. So as soon as they click submit quiz and confirm that, in a matter of seconds, their grade appears. It knows, you know, it knows what they've done and it shows them the grade. So that's a huge benefit of this. Um, but how you want it to grade, you get to choose that for this type of question. So if we look at these options for the types of grading, I would recommend either the first one or the fourth one, because I've played around with all of these and unexpected things happened when students took their quizzes or exams, and I had to go back through and do a lot of regrading as I played with these. Uh, I don't remember if the directions for these were always as clear as they are. If you wanna read about these, you can click this and it describes these, but even with those descriptions, and even, so, I mean, I've, I'm, a, I'm a mathematician and I've, I've seen this a lot, and it was still not clear to me from reading these directions how the grade would actually be calculated. So I actually had to try this a couple times to see. So here's how it would be calculated. First, all or nothing. That's the simplest. And this depends upon your philosophy for what you think the student should be able to do. 
So on this question, if there are two correct answers and they should know those, then if you select all or nothing, they have to select those two answers and those two answers only to get credit. And if they select those and those only, they get 100%. But if they only select one of them and not the other, or if they select both of those and an, and an additional one, they, let's say they select three, they get zero. So this is an all or nothing sort of thing as it says. Now that really depends upon you and what you think the student should be able to do. But if you're a partial credit giver, if you wanna give some partial credit, I recommend the last one, which is entitled right minus wrong selections. So this will, you see it says a point value here, that would update if I added or removed numbers of selections. So that number is based upon the number of choices that the student has. So that it automatically calculates that. But since I've only selected two correct answers, here's what it would do based upon the other ones that are wrong. Um, out of the seven total options, if they select only one of the correct answers, they'll get a 50 because they got half of the ones they should have gotten. If they select one of the correct answers and one of the wrong answers, then you'll start off with a base of 50, but because of that one wrong answer, they will subtract a portion away and they'll end up, I think, with a 42 or a 43. Okay, so if they select one wrong answer and all, sorry, one right answer and all of the wrong answers, they'll get a zero. Um, if they select two right answers, great, 100, but they select an additional wrong answer, it'll subtract a little bit from that and they'll end up with like a 92 or a 93. Is that clear on those? Nate, I have a question. Um, if they select all wrong answers, then is that going to go in the negative? No, the lowest they can get is a zero, Priya. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? And, and Kim and anybody else, if you guys hear anything that you want to add in and supplement or maybe even correct me if I misunderstand it, please feel free to do that. Well, that was a great explanation of those four different ways because it's very confusing to explain them. So no, that was fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and I would say I'd skip the middle two. I don't <laughs> know of a use, a reasonable use for the middle two. It's either all or nothing or go to the bottom and let it do the kind of multiple choice for you. Uh, the middle two are just are weird. I don't know why you'd ever want to use those, but maybe you'll find a use for it and then you can tell me about it. Um, so that is that is multiple select. Okay, so these are the ones where if it according to your philosophy for how you want to test your students, you're giving them the options and they're just selecting from that. So this requires uh, less memory you know, obviously, because they have the options and they know there's a right answer in there somewhere, unless you put an option up there, none of the above, which you could totally do. So at least they know something on there is going to be correct. But let's say you want to give them uh, a question where they actually have to recall something. And now we're talking sometimes this is remote or online. They've got their notes in front of them, but at least they have to find it somewhere. The next one I would say is fill in the blanks. There is a short answer option, which is similar. But I like fill in the blanks because it gives more freedom to do things, different types of questions with more than one blank. So fill in the blanks. Uh, we're going to look at one from, let me see, the Magnus effect. And so let me talk about this one because while we pull it up, and as opposed to giving you things before, because this is what it's going to look like if you create it. Now, when you create a question, you don't have to name it. You can, but you don't have to. So I leave this blank. This question incorporates something that you can do, and that is you can include an image with your question. So if, if you want to have more than just text, a textual question or statement or scenario, you can actually present an image to them. And you'll see the image a little bit later down when we scroll. And that's where that shows up here. You can import an image that they'll see when they take the exam. And another, so here's a little thing that I ended up realizing I need to tell my students because not everybody knows how to do this. If you have an image that you give them and if you want them to, to pry out any sort of detail from that image, you've got students who might be taking this exam 
where they have an HDMI connection to an 80 inch screen at home and they're seeing everything big and that's great. But then you're gonna have students, whether you want them to or not, who are looking at this on a phone and the screen is like that, that big in comparison. So in the middle, let's say you got a student on a decently sized laptop, like a 15 inch screen MacBook Pro and you want them to see detail in the image, you need to tell them how to zoom in because you can't expect them to know how to do it. And so I had to learn that like, oh, they just don't know how to do these things that I take for granted. So uh, on a PC, you do control, uh, control plus and control minus to zoom in what you're looking at in the easy shortcut click ways. If you're on a Mac, you have to do command plus or command minus to zoom in on the screen or zoom out. Macs don't have touch screens. So unless they're on an iPad, they can't like pinch and zoom and stuff. If they're on a touch screen, they could do that. But all, all of our iMac users or MacBook users rather, they don't have touch screens. So they have to know how to do the command plus and command minus. That's one thing with an image, just as something I picked up along the way. So here's how you actually create a multiple um, fill in the blank, let's say question. So FIB is the symbol for that one. So first you've got options down here and you can, I think it starts off with a bare minimum of let's say one text and one blank as noted over here. This is a modular way that you can put together a sentence that includes a blank. And so you have to pre-plan out where the blank is gonna show up in the sentence. So this sentence, I think I can show you with the preview. There's the image that's going to appear. So it's a physical scenario. It, in World War II, Great Britain had circular or cylindrical bombs that they'd spin up and drop to blow up some of Hitler's dams. And that's a visualization of that, something we talk about in class. But then I've got this, this question or the statement says, the bomb in the image is spun in order to provide lift after it is dropped. The blank blank, uh, I think I can't see it because of the pictures on the screen. The blank blank is the name used to describe this. So I want them to know the two words for the name of this, of this effect. And there it shows you the words. That's just a preview. But to get that in there, to get that statement with those blanks in there appropriately, you have to have text where there's text and in order, put blanks where there should be blanks. So the first statement is the bomb in the image is spun in order to provide lift after it is dropped. The next sentence, the, and then I'll have a blank for the first word, a blank for the second word. And so I have to have two blanks for that. And then finish off with another text section to finish off the sentence after the blanks. Does that make sense? Okay. So you have to pre-plan out where you want your blanks to go. Um, but then, then you have to tell it what the answers are. And so this is different than multiple select or multiple choice because you can't just check things you've already set or options. You've got to type in the options. And so this is a two word phrase called Magnus effect. And I give them two blanks. So they have one word in each blank. And I give them a heads up for that too. I say, if you see a fill in the blank question, and you see multiple blanks, there's one word per blank. So I tell them that because you're inevitably going to have somebody that jams everything into the first blank and leaves the rest of it empty. And it's hard to find a way to fight against that. But so I, I, I prep them with this. So I can accept Magnus in the first blank. And that's a, that's a name. It's a Gustav Magnus was the guy who that's named after. So it should be capitalized. However, if they don't capitalize it, I'm not going to penalize them for that here. So I give them the ability to do that. If I just put in Magnus with a capital M and left it at that, if they typed in Magnus with the lowercase m, D2L would count it wrong. Okay. Unless you would you were to check the case insensitive button. Okay. So then you could prevent that. But that still doesn't allow you to give them some freedom if they have spelling errors. So if they spelled Magnus, M-A-G-N-A-S, Magnus, case insensitive will still count that wrong because it's not spelled correctly. So there's no selection for that. So the way I do it, as opposed to doing case sensitive or insensitive, which doesn't account for spelling problems, 
is I use this thing called regular expression, which will show up again. Regular expression is super useful because it allows you to program in and continually add to the different options you will accept as a correct answer. This will prevent you from having to go back through and regrade everything to give partial or full credit back if the option that they wrote in doesn't exactly match what you pre-programmed. So when I started this in the beginning, I think I started off with just the answers. And then students have this crazy way of coming up with every possible variation around the answer that you actually taught them, which still could be counted as correct, whether capitalization or maybe slight spelling issues or just alternate ways to say something, which still could be considered correct. If you could think about that all in the front end, it saved your, you'd save yourself a lot of time. But what I end up doing is I create it, I give it, I go through everything and I recognize, ah, oh, I could accept that or that or that. Then I go back into my questions and I add those options in. So it's continually getting better. So I have to check it less and less over time. But the way you do this, check regular expression, you type an answer option, and then you have to put the pipe in. That's the little symbol above one of the slashes on your keyboard between enter and backspace. Um, that's the pipe. And then you type in another option. And if I wanted to give that option, like I suggested a minute ago, I could say M-A-G-N-A-S if I were going to accept that. And then if it saw any of those, it would count them right. That's regular expression, one of the most useful things in D2L that I've discovered. Um, so you do that for the first blank, do that for the second blank. You need to give it a weighting. So since there are two blanks, I gave them an equal 50-50 weighting. So if they get one of them and not the other, they'll get a 50 on this question. Uh, but if you think one word is much more important than the other one, you can weight it higher if that's, if that's appropriate. So there's that. There is fill in the blank. Any questions on multiple or on fill in the blank questions? One question, Nate. Um, what if there is text in between the two blanks? So if there's text in between the two, um, what you could do, Priya, is go up here to add text. I've got a one in there right now, so it's going to add one if I click on it, and I click on it. And so you can see down here, it should be at the bottom, it's added another text box. And so all I would have to do is rearrange the order of this to move this back up in between blank one and blank two, and then you could have text in between the blanks. So this would be doing it after the fact, which is a little bit more cumbersome. If you pre-plan it out where you want text, where you want blanks, then you just create them and add them, you know, so you don't have to rearrange them after the fact. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, so it really, so with doing this, pre-planning out your questions, knowing how this thing expects you to do it will save you a lot of time. I'll, I'll lean on Kim and the others. You guys have anything to add to that? Nate, I don't have a question, but I did have a comment because you used an image in this. Yes. And I found, so I use a fair amount of images in a, in a horse genetics class because they have to identify different coat color genes and different, you know, different traits that they can see and, and name those. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful with your file name for that, that it doesn't give them the answer and also any kind of alternate text on it. Right. So. You know, if I have a file name that says Palomino horse, and then I ask them what color it is, and they they hover over the image and the file name pops up. So I'm just, mm -hmm. as a tip, be aware sometimes if your file name actually gives the answer. So if this was, if this file name, I noticed yours was called Spinning Bomb, and it wasn't called Magnus Effect, and you already figured that out, but I thought I'd add that. That's a super good point. Actually, Rhonda, I hadn't even thought about that for this. That's just the name of that image, but that, that's really good. Anything else on this type of question? Fill in the blank. I was just going to add that, yes, using regular expression is the best way to do it. That's actually, it's not that old. It used to just be case sensitive and insensitive, and those were your options. So, um, that's one of those things that's been added just in the last couple of years. So it is possible, Nate, that when you started doing this, it didn't exist yet. <laughs> but that is the way to do it because it has, it's got the AI in it at that point. So it helps to remember things and it, 
it learns too. So there are things some in some that it can pick up on, on its own in some of the areas within it. So, yeah. well, which is it, helpful. It, it's super useful. It is cut down on the, so I still on all, I don't do it on quizzes and I tell the students that, but I do it on exams. I still read through every single exam to look through the questions that it counted wrong to see if there's some issue. I still do it for all of them. But updating the regular expression options has reduced the amount I have to actually do as far as changing grades and, you know, up, updating that. So it, it is very helpful, even if you go through them all like I continue to do. OK, so those are the most common that I use non-calculation type questions. But it's really the calculation question that I use most. So when you're actually requiring them to use an equation to calculate a number to spit out an answer, that's what I use a ton of. And so that's what we're gonna look at. And I'll show you a couple and we'll talk through how you do these and you'll see some examples for how to do this. Um, so for Wandy, this is, I mean, Wandy, this is right up your alley. I mean, these are things that the majority of questions, let's say in a, at least an entry level mathematics class would be, would be benefited by. So I'm going to go into my calculation section, the speed of sound. I need to give myself a proper reference. So let me go back in. So now I'm going to go into the calculations. Um, kind of Bredouille, speed of sound. And this one, this question, so these are called arithmetic questions. And the symbol for those is two plus two. So if I were to go back, you can see the question type. It shows it as two plus two, whereas fill in the blank was FIB, multiple select was MS, uh, multiple choice was MC. I can tell this is an arithmetic question. And so there are a couple things to know. I did name this one, uh, the speed of sound in the troposphere, which is the lowest layer of the atmosphere. There's an equation to do that. And so, you have to also pre-plan these out. Now, these require even more pre-planning than do the previous non-calculation questions, because when you do a when you type a an arithmetic question that requires an equation and one or more independent variables, so numbers they're going to have to plug into an equation to get the answer, you have to pre-plan what those variables will be. You have to find or identify a symbol for those within the quiz question. And you also have to give ranges and options for what those variables can be chosen from, from according to D2L. So here's the question. What is the speed of sound at? And then I put this symbology here. So if I just put a number, if I ask them, what's the speed of sound at 10,000 feet on a standard day? Well, that means every single student would get the same question, which means the answer's all the same, which means they could cheat. So what I do is I utilize the power of D2L to randomize the numbers that it gives them for an altitude with a little bit of direction from me. So that is a variable that D2L is gonna choose a number for each student who clicks on this question in this quiz or test. So the way you type a variable in the question is you have to use the curly braces or curly brackets, and then whatever you put inside that will be the variable, okay? But when the question shows up, that'll be a number. So let me, let me show you what the preview would look like. So here's an example. It just chose an altitude randomly according to how I told it. What is the speed of sound at 15,856 feet on a standard day? D2L chose that. And if I were to do this again, it would be a different altitude. So every student should have a different number that pops up. Okay, so there's, there's what that will look like. Now, I also do this. This is another tip that I ended up doing. Uh, can't remember if I started off, but I tell, so this is the way I roll in my classes. I don't want to have to work every single question for every single student because they did things differently. I get things really standardized. And by that, I mean, I tell them exactly how to round. OK, 
Okay, you have to do that. Otherwise, the answers are going to be all over the place. So in class, the way we roll is we solve an equation. We get all the way through it and we only round at the end. So I don't allow them to do a little portion of it, write it down, round it, enter that back in, keep going, because the answer is going to be way off. Their process could be good, but the answer is off. So that's a weakness of D2L quizzing. You can't really get at their process. You can only get at their answer. So to prevent issues, I tell everybody, do everything this way. And then the answer, that's just the answer. There aren't any other options. So I tell them how far to round in parentheses, round the answer to the tenths place. I also tell them what units I want the answer in. So basic units in the English system for speed would be feet per second. If your metric would be meters per second, but that's not how we live and think. So I tell them I want the answer in miles per hour. So they know exactly what they need to do as far as calculations and conversions to get to the answer and where to round it to. So I make all that very clear. So there's no guesswork. Um, so there is only one answer based upon the altitude I give them, not multiples. So there's the question all programmed in with that. All right, the next thing you do is you program in the equation telling D2L how to calculate the answer based upon the altitude that it pre-selects randomly for each student. So this is simply just typing in, you know, using the asterisk for multiply, the slash for divide, the little caret button, the little caret symbol for raise it to a power. There's the equation. There's no big equation editor you have to use. It's just simple keyboard stuff. But then the symbol for the altitude with curly braces, you have to use that symbology again inside the equation to program it. So now it knows how to calculate the answer. So when I do the preview right here, so based upon, see it did another altitude, it picked another one when I previewed it again. So based upon this altitude and that equation, that is the correct answer it expects to see. If it's not that answer, it's probably gonna count it wrong unless you do some things like I'm gonna show you in a minute. Okay, so there's that. Now we get to how precise do you want the answer? Okay, because they could have made a small rounding error at the end and maybe you're willing to accept that. Maybe you're willing to accept a whole lot more. I don't know, you can, you can do you on that one, but here's where you say how precise you want the answer. Um, this is really the number of decimal places you want the precision of the answer to go to. So if, if you select one, it's gonna go out to the tenths place, to one decimal place, and that's what it's gonna look at for the answer, or the hundredths place or the thousandths place, you select that. And when you check this box, that enforces that precision upon the answers that they select. Okay, so I tell them I want the answer, or I tell D2L, I want it to go to the tenths place for the answer. And when you see what it does, it gives the answer out to the tenths place, even if it's a zero. It's gonna expect that for the answer, okay? Then, um, then the tolerances. So this is how far D2L will go with the answer it calculates. This is how much you give them plus or minus on the answer they input compared to the correct answer D2L calculated. So. If I told D2L to get the right answer out to the tenths place, to one decimal place, I'm going to give the students plus or minus a tenth for the right answer. So on this one, if we do another preview, the, the correct answer is 717.8. But with that plus or minus 0.1, they could type in 717.7 or 717.9, and it would count it correct. That's within reason for me with for small little rounding issues that they may have made. But you can expand that out by increasing that tolerance as far as you want. And the for whatever reason, if you wanted to go as opposed to an absolute tolerance of 0.1 or 0.2, you could also add a percentage of the answer. So you could say it's OK if they're plus or minus 5% away from the right answer, and it'll do that. So that's how you can work in some uh, I guess, variability, if, if, if it makes sense to do that. Then you can also, you don't have to do this, but it's important to identify what units a number is in if you're dealing with actual values that have units. So I require them to not only give a numeric answer, but to say what units their answer is in. 
Now, I, I recognize even though I've already told them what units I want the answer in, I expect them to tell me what units the answer is in because they do not do that automatically. And they might have another unit that they put it in and then it's wrong because I asked for miles per hour. So the units, that's text. The problem with text is they've got so many ways they can type that. So once again, this is where regular expression comes in to save me some time is if the answer for the units is miles per hour, you can see lowercase mph is good, but then if I type the pipe, capital M, lowercase ph will also be accepted because they'll do that too, or all caps nph is fine, or miles divided by hours if they wanna do it that way, or the whole word miles per hour. So all these different options are fine, but you've gotta program it in, otherwise D2L will count it wrong and you'll have to go in and regrade that. Now, I also say that the units are worth 10% of the answer. So they can get the right numeric answer, but that only gets them 90% of the way there if I require them to put the unit in, which I do. But you also have to check regular expression for it to accept all these different options for the units. Now, that's, that's all programming the question, programming the equation, the precision and the tolerance, the units but now you have to tell it how you want it to randomize that variable. So in this one, there's only one variable, altitude, and I want every student to get a, a different altitude. So now I type in the name of the variable. There's only one in this case, H, and by default, I think there's one of them down here. You can add more if you want more. Uh, so H, you don't have to put the curly braces around this one like you did in the previous two cases. And in this, you tell it, where you want it to start with an altitude. So I just chose some literal odd number. So it gives the randomizing a better, a better mix. So you could choose any minimum. I give it a maximum number. I don't want it to give them an altitude that's beyond the ones place. So no decimal places it will give them. And the last number is the steps it will take between altitude options. So it could give somebody 30, 3,103 feet. But if you add 117 to that, that's the next altitude that somebody else could get. So it's all in increments of 117. So there are many different reasons why you might want to adjust some of these numbers. Um, but to give them an odd sort of mix of altitudes that aren't all just like 36,000, 25,000, I do those steps with that starting value. Any questions on, on that question or any little part of it? Okay, let me, let me show you one more uh, calculation question that has a little bit more going on. Continuity Bernoulli pipe flow. So let me go to that one. So Continuity Bernoulli pipe flow, and we'll choose this first one. Okay, this one, as you can see, has multiple input variables. So this one, if you imagine a pipe and then the pipe gets smaller as the pipe flows along, fluid is gonna change velocity through that pipe based upon the diameter of the pipe and the fluid speed coming in. And so that's what this question is getting at. So if I want everybody to have a different question to solve, a different scenario, then here's my, first diameter, the diameter of the opening of the pipe. Here's the variable for the diameter somewhere else in the pipe as it shrinks or gets bigger. And then I give them all the same altitude. And the only reason for that is I don't want them to have to do some huge calculation for density, which is important. I use the same altitude. So that, that's fine if they all have the same number there. And they probably already have it in their notes in this class. And then here's the variable for the velocity of the air entering the pipe. So they've got three input variables, D2L does, that it will mix up for everybody. So that makes everybody's problem really, really unique. And I want them to tell me what's the velocity in that second diameter. So as the velocity goes from the big diameter to the small, what's the new velocity based upon this input velocity? So I know I've got three variables. You can see the equation. It's not a very complex equation, but it takes into account all three of those variables. Again, all of those in curly braces, curly brackets. The precision, the, uh, the units, you can see all that. Again, um, 
regular expression for that, but here's where I've added a couple more variables and programmed them in. Okay, so th this is really just based upon what kind of questions you want to ask and what do you need. And if you see a preview of this one, there's an example of what it would show up like for one student with the calculated answer. Now, if this one is a good example, I'm glad this one randomly popped up because this is something that I don't know, Kim or somebody else may have an answer to, but it may just be a shortcoming of D2L quizzes. And that is when you specify that the answer must be precise out to the tenths place. And based upon the values that are randomly generated, the answer comes out like this answer does 43.0. Okay, 43 and 43.0 are the same number. But since I've told D2L, I want it precise to the tenths place because not every one is going to come out to the ones place. It might be 48.7. So people have different answers. For this specific one, it comes out to 43.0. If a student types in 43 and that's it, it will count it wrong. It needs to see that decimal place, a number there, if it's specified that it should have a number there, even if it's zero. So I will have a handful on every single exam, which is one of the reasons why I still look through them all, where it comes out like this. It's 43.0, they put 43, it marked it wrong, and I have to go back and give them credit for it, which is easy enough to do, but it's kind of a, a pain. So this very smart technology is not very intelligent when it comes to this. It's a, it's really smart until it's something like the point zero. The only way to really get around that is if you actually take it out another decimal point and then hope that it's not two decimal points that end up at zero. <laughs> so, um, but that's just part of the, the technology behind it. It can only be so smart. It, I, you, you may have also run into the, you allow the variance. It gets a little bit confused sometimes if it was a zero and it ended up being down one, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't sometimes, and they may have improved that since the, the last time I was in a session about it, but if it was, instead of it being 43, if the answer was really 42.9, it confuses it. Yeah. Um, so it's technology, yeah. it tries. <laughs> well, I will say it is, it is awesome. And it is much quicker than you having to hand grade everything. But it still, in my opinion, requires you to go through and look. I mean, I wouldn't feel comfortable just letting these grades go into the grade book and not looking at them because of issues like that and a couple others. Wandi, did you have a comment or question? Yes. Could you go back to the problem where you set it up? I want to do a screenshot about how you, <laughs> yeah, just to go to the bottom. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. And Wandi, I think this is being recorded and it will show up. So Kim or Sheila could probably speak to that in a minute, but everybody will be able to go back in and look at this. If there's any part of it you want to look at again. And I will say, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody one-on-one -on -one or come to your office if you're comfortable. I'll wear one of these and we could go over it or I could do a Zoom if there's anything else you want to see. Because I know seeing this is just sort of like a, a shot off the bow. This is kind of like wetting the whistle. You're not going to learn how to do it just by watching one of these. But if you want help, I'm more than happy to help you, as I'm sure Kim and others would be. Hey, Nate, a quick question. Have you ever thought about using the expand question hint to remind students that it rounds out to the tenth, even if it's a whole number, so include zero or something like that, so that shows up within the question? You know, that's a that's a really good idea. I haven't used, I've not used the the question hint on anything nor have I used question feedback. Um, yeah, I guess if you're gonna do that, since, since these are randomized, you would never know that an answer is gonna pop up that way unless it's a set, set inputs and a set answer that's gonna be that way. So that would mean you'd have to do it for every single calculation question, which isn't a big deal, but yeah, that, that's a good idea to prevent that. But I'll tell you what, students would still, they'd still do it. I agree with you, but it was a thought. Because <laughs> I actually speak that out in class. I tell them that issue and I tell them how far to round and I tell them the point zero thing and they, they do it every single time, a handful. 
but yeah, that would that would help. Okay, so there's there's calculation questions. So Wandi, did, did that give you what you needed? Okay, so let me now let me now back off from looking at specific questions, and and talk uh, I guess a little bit about creating a quiz because before this I'd not created a single quiz in D2L before March of 2020, so this was all new to me when I started learning it. So if you wanted to do a quiz, um, and I would say build up a question library first. Once you get a whole bunch of really good questions, then you can put together a quiz. Let me just show you what a quiz looks like. So in assessments and quizzes, under manage quizzes, I'm gonna to go to the very first quiz in this class and show you the different options you have when you're creating a quiz. So I do name quizzes for sure, because quizzes are gonna be something that shows up in a module that students are gonna see and click on and you need to name it. It's also gonna be connected to something in the grade book. So you need to have that connection there. You can either build out your grade book before or when you build quizzes, you can create grade items that go in the grade book from the quiz itself. So you can do that in either option. I'm not sure what the recommended process is, but you can do it either way. Um, you get down, so you're in the properties section of a quiz. You can add and edit questions right here. So this is a one question quiz. If you've created a question library, when you click add or edit questions, you can pull questions from your question library. If you've created nothing, you would have to, at the same time while you're trying to create a quiz, create questions. So I would recommend getting all sorts of questions down to give yourself a starting point to pull from to create a quiz. And now you can see what I said before, I had this quiz or this question and by default, it was probably worth five points, but because this is a one question quiz, I clicked on edit values and made this one question worth 100 points. So this is a single question, 100 point quiz. Um, and that's where, that's where the points come from. When you open the quiz up, or actually before you open the quiz, before you start the quiz, you can give them some directions. And here are the directions I give them. I tell them, you've got five minutes to take this quiz because I think being able to do things in an amount of time is important, especially for academic integrity, but also for just their, their knowledge. Um, I tell them, even though you've got unlimited attempts at the quiz, your highest grade will be recorded because I didn't use many quizzes in my classes before last year. But when I saw this, I started incorporating many more quizzes and I use it for practice for them. Everybody should get 100 on these quizzes because they can take it as many times as they want. Okay, and if they make 100 the first time, I tell them keep taking it because that may have been a fluke. Do it until you can consistently get the right answer and you know you're getting 100 and whatever the highest grade is will go in the grade book, but practice, practice, practice. I talk about rounding. I give them heads up for those rules. I talk about how to type the units in, all that stuff. But then that's only before they start the quiz. So this, this will show up. But once they click start quiz, this will go away. But if you want them to see that, then the header and footer for the quiz, you can restate it. So that way this will show up while they're taking the quiz at the top and or the bottom. So there's a footer. You could have those directions at the bottom. Uh, some other things, and there's, I'm sure, best practices on this somewhere, but I always disable right clicks when they're in the quiz and I disable pager and alerts and all that kind of stuff to try to protect them. I don't allow any hints because I don't put any hints in so they either know it and can do it or they can't. So that's under that first section, but now under restrictions. This is where I enable them to take it multiple times. So once you go in here, this is where you set when the quiz starts and stops. So for me, this is from a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. Uh, this would have been a Monday, Wednesday or Friday, I don't remember, but I have the quiz start at the end of the class period where that material was covered. And I'll tell them, hey, at the end of the class today, a quiz is gonna open up. And so the class gets out at 1225. So I set that quiz to open as soon as class stops. And then I give them basically two days to take the quiz till the next class period. So if this was a Monday, they had at the end of class on Monday until the beginning of class on Wednesday to take that quiz. So there's a limited time frame in which they have to take it, but they can take it as many times as they want in that time frame. Uh, I don't like to leave them open because I had this thing when before I put a stop date on it, I just start them off and then they could take it. I had students going back and taking quizzes 
at final exam time. I'm like, ah, I didn't really intend for that. So I have to put a start and a stop on it. And then a little bit further down, this is where you can enforce a time limit on each attempt. And that's what I told them, five minutes. You can also give them a grace period, which I do. Like if they're in the middle of it and they're five minutes, I give them one minute before it just kind of the digital gate comes down and shuts them off. Um, and I select prevent student from making further changes. So they can't continue doing things after that period. Uh, then, so there's that. Uh, so that's the time range. I guess, yeah, it's assessment. This is where you allow them to do it multiple times. So this is where you can connect it to a grade item. This is where you could create a grade item if you want it, if you didn't have one before. And here's the number of attempts. So one up to 10 or unlimited. And I do unlimited. Now, I only do unlimited on numeric calculation quizzes. If it's a fill in the blank quiz, I give them one shot because I also let them see the answers when they're done with the quiz if they get it wrong. So if they miss a fill in the blank quiz and I show them the answer, it's a no brainer when they do it again, they just retype what I showed them. So for calculation questions, they get unlimited attempts, fill in the blank, multiple choice, they get, they get one shot. Uh, and this is where you say which attempt you want them to be able to keep. I say highest attempt. And there's only one more thing in this submission views. This is where you can allow them to see if they get it wrong, you can show them the correct answer so they could maybe work towards that and then practice to do it again. Or you could not let them see anything. So by default, it doesn't show the question. It doesn't show them anything when they take a quiz. But I have added in, I've clicked this and added in a new view where it shows them the questions they answered incorrectly, and it shows them the correct answer to that question. Again, so they can practice it before they take the quiz again. Uh, it, it's meant to help them. And they can see that throughout the semester. If they look back at this quiz, they can see it to practice it along the way. So we're out of time. There are a couple more things with tests as far as limiting the time frame and and all that sort of thing, but to respect your time, that's that's it. Any any questions at the end or comments that you have? 